the king of the planets, the gas giant, the planet of storms. The solar system's failed star. All of these refer to the planet Jupiter, and although the first three are true, the last one is a common misconception. It is true that Jupiter is primarily made up of hydrogen and helium, both being the main element and stars that allow for fusion to take place. But Jupiter is lacking a key ingredient, mass. For mass brings forth pressure, and pressure brings temperature. And even if it had 20 times the amount of mass, it would still not become a star, but then it would become an actual failed star, a brown dwarf. They're not quite massive enough to fuse hydrogen into helium, but they do have localized events of fusion of the heavier deuterium, giving them just enough energy to be released as light and heat, but not enough to ignite their atmospheres. By adding more mass, we can go further and reach the most common stars in the universe, red dwarfs. They range from 85 Jupiter masses to 60% the mass of the Sun, and have enough mass for hydrogen-driven fusion to take place. Much like the name suggests, this makes them glow in a faint deep red, just like a lightly heated piece of metal would. But the metal can be heated further, representing stars like our Sun. The fusion of hydrogen in their core can produce enormous amounts of energy, continuously for billions of years, but the fuel slowly over time is still being burned away, meaning that slowly the dwindling resources of the star do eventually catch up with it, and with the relenting presence of gravity it pushes the star with a pressure that it can no longer push back against. As gravity wins and the star is pushed inwards, it causes a jump in the pressure and temperature of the core, kickstarting the fusion of helium. This new source of energy is able to push against gravity, but it also pushes with much more ferocity, causing the outer layers of the star to expand outwards, leading to them cooling down in the process and producing a red giant. Red giants will continue to burn for a further few hundred million years, fusing helium into carbon and later on oxygen, with both of them slowly building up in the core. Instability in the rate of helium fusion and sudden pressure changes in the core combine as the leading reasons for thermal pulses plaguing the outer layers of a red giant. This extreme version of solar wind pushes the outer layers with so much force that they get ripped off the star, forming a planetary nebula, leaving behind only the carbon-oxygen core of the star, now as a white dwarf, which will spend the rest of its long life slowly radiating away its heat. In a theoretical world, the metal would be heated even further, and as a Bunsen burner tells us, the blue flame is the hottest, which, you guess it right, it means that this whole setup has been a scam. Back to the stars, we see that blue giants are the largest and most energetic of the main sequence stars, reaching some of the highest temperatures that stars can, leading to these stars not going so quietly into the night. After the hydrogen burning phase, they expand into supergiants, the largest type of known star. They are able to continue the fusion process further due to the outer layers remaining in place despite the thermal pulses, due to them containing too much mass to be dissipated away, resulting in them causing high internal pressures and temperatures. The fusion of elements continues until the production of iron, which cannot be fused further due to the fact that its fusing costs more energy than it would be producing, and so a massive sphere of iron is slowly growing in the core of the star. Fusion releases radiation pressure which up to this point has been able to hold the star from being overwhelmed by the gravitational pressure. But with a core that can no longer fuse, it results in a decrease of radiation pressure and therefore the resistance towards gravity also diminishes. Until a breaking point, in which gravity causes the star to collapse into itself. This increase in density in the core and the additional pressure 
causes such as spike in temperature that iron undergoes neutralization, releasing a shockwave of energy as protons and electrons combine to form neutrons, and in the process release an enormous amount of highly energetic neutrinos, with the remaining elements undergoing rapid neutron capture, resulting in heavier than iron elements being formed. This chaotic and unpredictable environment is not stable, and only lasts for a fraction of a second. The amount of energy radiated within the collapse of the core causes shockwaves that rebound the falling outer layers, releasing all of that energy as the star goes supernova. The result of all the pressure exchanges causes the core of the star to fall into two camps, depending on the mass of the star. If the mass is between 8 and 20 solar masses, then the remnants of the core become a neutron star. The plasma in the core has fully turned into neutrons, which are then compressed together to the point where degeneracy pressure starts taking effect. The pressure generated by the constrained neutrons is able to push against gravity, forming an extremely dense environment that becomes locked in place and stable. When we look at a star with a mass greater than 20 solar masses, then even the Pauli exclusion principle cannot hold the Fermi gas from collapsing due to gravity. This results in the creation of a black hole. However, recently there has been a rise in popularity of the idea of the third possibility, ignoring of course a pair instability supernova. This third option being a quark star. But the question is just how realistic is that possibility? One of the first things that you learn when it comes to particle physics is that individual quarks cannot exist and therefore cannot be detected. This is due to the fact that the amount of energy that is required to separate two quarks is the same amount of energy required for two new quarks to form. So when the original pair is separated, two new pairs are formed. But there are ways to overcome such a problem. With high enough temperatures, a quark gluon plasma can be formed, where quarks can become deconfined and no longer need to interact as pairs like in mesons or as triplets in hadrons, but instead can interact with all the surrounding quarks. This has been achieved in particle accelerators, where heavy atomic nuclei are accelerated to ultra-relativistic speeds and directed towards each other. The resultant collision creates an environment that generates a temperature exceeding 1.6 trillion Kelvin. With this new and available energy being present, it heats up the quarks beyond the deconfinement threshold, and therefore they are no longer locked in their hadrons. This collective of quarks and gluons, however, are also extremely unstable, in the sense that this is not a permanent state and it is rather short-lived. As a matter of fact, in the order of yoctoseconds, which I must admit that up to this point I wasn't even aware that it was a prefix that existed. The reason for the short lifespan is because the creation of the quark gluon plasma is based on the presence of extremely high temperatures within a very small volume, and at those scales heat dissipates quite quickly, which results in the very short lifespan since as soon as the temperature drops below the deconfinement threshold, they return back to their usual paired up nature. Luckily though, just like any phase diagram can tell you, there are always two routes you can take. You could change the temperature, or you could change the pressure, and achieve the same thing. And here is where the difference is made. When extreme pressure is applied, then quantum chromodynamic matter is formed which, much like the quark gluon plasma, quantum chromodynamic matter is also made of the exact same deconfined quarks. However, instead of achieving it through temperature, it is achieved through pressure. And due to quarks being fermions, it means that the same or at least very similar rules should apply to them as do to any other Fermi gas, with degeneracy taking its hold under the pressure, making the QCD matter stable just like how neutron degeneracy matter in a neutron star is stable. As mentioned before, quark gluon plasma has experimentally been proved in particle accelerators. However, there is no experiment 
that could even come close to producing the pressures needed to test QCD matter. This experimental limitation makes this hypothesis far more difficult to prove, and the uncertainties surrounding this subject go even further. The very point of QCD matter being a stable state could be wrong, as the equation of state of ultra-dense matter is incomplete, and results in significant challenges when it comes to making accurate predictions for the properties of matter under such pressure. QCD matter, just like QGP, allows for color exchanges to take place, but unlike QGP, this can lead to color superconductivity due to the extreme pressures, which in turn can lead to chromomagnetic instabilities, causing the surface of the star to fluctuate, providing further destabilization of the conditions. Furthermore, QCD matter might be under threat of phase instabilities, emerging from the need of matter to be in the most stable possible phase under those extreme conditions. And this can cause a massive shift from a quark star mostly made up of up and down quarks to a strange star made up of strange quarks. Strange quarks could be more stable than ordinary nuclear matter, making them one of the most stable phases possible. But the shift to strange quarks would generate instabilities through massive phase changes happening, releasing enormous amounts of energy and mass in the form of flares, which would further destabilize the conditions for a strange star to exist. But even if we assume that indeed strange quarks are the configuration of lowest free energy available and somehow there is a smooth transition of phases, still all of the previous instabilities with quark stars will be decreased but still very much present. But perhaps we are looking at this problem wrong. Perhaps we don't need all of those mathematical and experimental results if we could just simply observe a quark star, or even better, a strange star. That would surely result in a strong basis of confirmation. But what exactly would be the telltale signs that would differentiate a strange star from just a regular neutron star? As you might expect, strange stars would be far more compact than neutron stars due to the ability of quarks to be closer together than neutrons and therefore make the star appear smaller in radius than the mass would indicate for a neutron star. Due to the different surface composition, it would also have distinct thermal emission signatures, which could result in different cooling rates than neutron stars, due to the greater efficiency of emission processes. However, due to the equation of state of ultra-dense matter being incomplete, there are many neutron star models that allow for a wide range masses, radii, and cooling rates, meaning that using these will not result in a clear-cut answer. The distinctions do not hold even by trying to measure the increase in magnetic flux by measuring the spin period of the star. The spin rate, which is already amplified by the reduced size of a neutron star, means that it would be even further amplified by an even more compact strange star. And yet, even if the neutron star with the fastest known spin rate were to shrink its radius by 30%, its new spin rate would still be within the theoretical limits for a neutron star. Furthermore, if we are to assume a bare quark star, that would mean that it would be held together by the strong force rather than gravity, allowing it to not be constrained by the Eddington limit, and therefore radiate a higher luminosities than normally allowed for sustained periods of time, making them quite distinctive, but such objects are yet to be observed. All of that, in addition to observational uncertainties, which always play their role, makes it very difficult to produce any sort of reliable confirmation whether quark or strange stars truly exist. Even if all of these problems are simply ignored, it must be said that stellar physics doesn't do very well when it comes to fine margins. The rapid changes that a core undergoes in both pressure and temperature within splits of a second, the unpredictability of the compressions, shocks and rebounds of the outer layers altogether develop an extremely unstable environment. So much so 
that mass ejections are very common, and they can significantly change the nature of the star, meaning that even with the potential instabilities of the theoretical matter being ignored, even with assuming that we have been extremely unlucky with our observations, we would still need for a state of matter which clearly requires very specific settings to be formed and remain sustained in that state through one of the most chaotic environments in the universe. The changes in each of the steps of stellar evolution that we discussed prior had been at the scale of tens of solar masses. To assume that the turbulent environment of a collapsing supergiant would allow for a transition margin of 0.1 to 0.5 solar masses is perhaps not statistically impossible, but realistically extremely unlikely. I would love to find out in the future that the conclusion I've reached is wrong, and that there are more steps in the already fascinating journey of stellar evolution. However, I can't help but think that a quark or a strange star would be a structure with far too specific needs in a too unforgiving place. Perhaps it can be seen as an allegory for life itself, and I'm sure that the rare Earth hypothesis believers will agree with my arguments, but not look so kindly on my conclusions. Either way, it is important to be clear just how far away such a discovery really is, and not needlessly lead people on. <laughs>